amazing love. Who, is there anything that can separate us from the love of God? The repeated question that I keep asking is, are you circumcised in the heart? Are you circumcised in the heart? Let's turn to Ephesians 1, 11, please. The first parallel of physical circumcision to circumcision of the heart is that it is done to you, not by you. Jesus was tempted as a man in every way, just like we are tempted, yet without sin. He did the work. He fulfilled the law. And he paid the penalty of sin, even though he did not sin. The forgiveness of your sin, debt, and the rewards of his righteousness are accounted to you through simply entrusting your life to Christ. Circumcision of the heart is done to you, not by you. The second parallel is that both are completed at a very private, secret place. You must allow Jesus to take your old motives, passions, and ambitions on himself in his death. And then be conformed to him as a new person in him. The new creation is life with the will of Christ driving you from the inside at your most secret place. The second parallel is that both are completed at a very private, secret place. The third parallel is that you cannot tell either has happened unless they are exposed. The world will try to seal you shut with its tolerance, political correctness, or no hate speech. The world may try to hide your new life from shining under its bushel of trials, persecutions and struggles. The world may try to bribe you from shouting it from the rooftops with its riches, power, and politics. The power of the resurrected Lord does not stay hidden from view. There is no power or authority that can keep that secret from being exposed. Examine yourself to see if you are of the faith yourself to see if Jesus is in you. The Holy Spirit will make it plain to you if you are a new creation driven by the desires of Christ. That was number three. You can't tell either has happened unless they are exposed. Number four. It states that circumcision is the removal of flesh from one's life. Your instincts and nature were sinful from the get-go. And the wages of sin is death. You cannot serve two masters. Either Jesus Christ comes in your life and gets rid of them, or he doesn't come. Gets rid of the old man, or it, he doesn't come. Allowing Jesus to enter your most private, secret place changes you. You cannot go on living for the world, money, power, and pleasure. You have a new higher motive in Jesus Christ. Through entrusting your life in Him, He puts to death the old way. He takes it out. It's a removal. The new motivation is so satisfying. Jesus will never disappoint. Never. Jesus never fails when He becomes the only motivation and the desire of your heart. That was number four. The fourth parallel states that it is a removal from the flesh of one's life. Number five, physical circumcision and circumcision of the heart can be painful. It is painful. There is hope beyond the pain. Jesus endured the pain for the joy that was set before him. And, and us as believers... We have trials to endure, but we have something to endure them for. An eternal life. A, a, a full life in Him. You have a cross to carry. The cutting away of your old nature brings pain through Satan. 
or, or the world's hateful reaction, the loss of your old comforts, maybe even your friends. We talked about the, the, the tortures for Christ. You know, people in your own family may reject you for trusting in Christ. It's painful. Even the loving discipline of the Father can be painful as he guides us to keep in his way. That was number five. Circumcision can be painful. Number six, circumcision of the heart cannot be reversed. Now this brings us to the final point in the series. We're done. Well, almost done today. You know, there are many doctrines out there that, that hone in on this. One idea as a crux point in denominational differences. You know, some call it eternal security. Others call it perseverance of the saints. Others say as, as long as you don't actively reject God's will or purposes or purposely choose your own way, nothing else in all creation will reverse the process of salvation or circumcision of the heart. You know, God uses physical circumcision as an example, as a symbol of what it means to be circumcised of the heart. And it cannot be reversed. Neither can circumcision of the heart. Now there are many examples that we can point to and explain. Well, I know so and so. And he said he believed. And now he says he's an atheist. He doesn't believe in God at all. You know, examples like this and others abound everywhere. Did the circumcision not take did they lose their salvation? Does God in his mercy and grace just overlook the apparent shameful activities of his saints? Now these are some serious thoughts to examine. And from scripture and, and from the standpoint of human judgment, we, you know, we really can't tell who it is that has been saved or who hasn't been saved. We can't answer these questions for others, but we can answer them for ourselves. We can test ourselves to see if Jesus is in us. In Ephesians 1, 11, it says, In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in the conformity of, with the purpose of his will in order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of His glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Guaranteeing. It's a deposit. It, it's, it's sealed by the Holy Spirit. No higher thing can seal that. No death, no life, no persecution. Nothing can take away that. It's sealed. Warren Wiersbe, is, he, he commented on, on, on this particular security. He says, the, God, the security of God's sheep is assured in several ways. First, by definition. We have eternal life. That and that can cannot be conditional and still be eternal. The second point he makes is this life is a gift, not something we can earn or merit. If we were not saved by our own good works but by grace, then we cannot be lost by our bad works. Pretty interesting. He also goes on to say it is important to keep in mind that Jesus was talking about sheep. True believers, not counterfeits. The dog and the pig will go back into sin. But the sheep, being a clean animal, will follow the shepherd into green pastures. He continues on and he says, most of us know people who profess to be saved and then went back into sin. But their doing so only proved that they never really trusted Christ to begin with. Jesus did not promise security to anyone but his true sheep. 
There is not security to those who have made lip profession, but those but whose lives do not give evidence of true salvation. Let's turn to 2 Timothy 2.19, please. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a catchphrase that Christians like to pull to. You know, to a certain extent, we want belief in this salvation to be inclusive as, as inclusive as possible. You know, we all have friends and relatives that say and that acknowledge God. Yeah, you know, I believe in God. Hi. I, I, I know he exists. And we'd like to turn our wish for their salvation into a hope or, or something more than a wish. You know, even something more than, than a hope and a prayer. You know, we want everyone we know that we love to go to heaven. And then we'd like to have the faith in their confession faith or whatever you want to call it, that it is enough to put them on the good side of God. You know, you will not save your parents. You will not save your children. You will not save your friends. Your faith, your faith is only for, for you. And really, only the Lord knows those that are His. And, and, and the reason I say this is because there are some people that feel, hey, I'm going to go to heaven. And they're really not going to go. They're deceived into thinking that they're saved based on association, earthly wisdom, or, or even someone else's evaluation. You know, I'm better than half the world. You, you know, they, they, the statement, they, they did a study, and 90% of the world thinks that they're better than average. I don't know. It, it, mathematically, you know, it's almost an impossibility. But, you know, some people just think, you know, I'm better than average. I'm going to make it. You know, my, my bad things are less than my good things. So there's people that are deceived into thinking, I'm going to go to heaven. They have never done a personal examination compared to Christ. They've never tested themselves to see if Jesus is really living in them. In, in 2 Timothy 2, 19, it says, Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows those that are His. The Lord knows those that are His. And, Everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. Let's turn to Titus 1.15, please. Now, I can't judge you to tell you if you're going to heaven or not. You know, I can hope. It's not up to you either. God is not going to put you on the witness stand for me. God is not going to put me on the witness stand for you. And certainly, God is not going to put you on the witness stand for yourself. His judgment is true and right. He knows your heart. If you are a true believer or just a claimer. In, in Titus 1.15, it says, To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. Verse 16 says, They claim to know God, but by their actions they deny Him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Please let's turn to Mark 4, 3. At our last youth group meeting, um, it was April Fool's Day, April 1st, and uh, Ginger Wright, she, she told me, I, I get, the week before, she says, I, I got a great April Fool's. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some Oreo cookies, 
and I'm going to compromise them. I'm going to stick. I'm going to stick a bunch of toothpaste in them. Okay. So, anyways, all week passes, and then for me, you know, my mind's just not there. And, and, and May Wright, she got this big tray of Oreo cookies, you know, and she's coming down the steps with them, and I'm, I'm, I'm seeing Oreo cookies. Who Oreos? Yes. You know. And so she puts them on the table, you know, and, I, and I'm sitting there visiting with uh, 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 Mark is there, and and uh, Ginger's there, and a few of the youth kids are there, and we're in a circle, and, you know, I kind of sneak one of these Oreo cookies, and I pop one in my mouth, and, <laughs> and I'm sitting there chewing on this Oreo cookie, and, and the first thing I think, man, mm, mint. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and Mark picks up an Oreo cookie, and he starts chopping on it, he says, he says, there's no mint in mine. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sitting there chewing on it, and I'm from, 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 you know, like the, the Oreo's sitting there, the, the taste of the toothpaste is starting to get overpowering, and, and mixing with the, with the, the, the chocolate and everything, it started getting kind of bitter, you know, it's kind of a swill in my mouth, and, and then I'm starting to see Ginger's eyes, you know, she's just hiding something, you know, and she told me the week before, and then finally, it, yeah, there it is. Uh-huh, yeah. This is the compromised Oreo cookie. Uh-huh. And so I did not finish eating the Oreo cookie. In fact, I didn't finish swallowing what was in my mouth. I, I went to the trash. <coughs> uh, but Kat wasn't there for the whole drama. And so and neither was Austin. I think Austin had one of those cookies too. But, <laughs> So I took a few of these compromised cookies to her. And uh, you know, she said, mmm, Oreo cookies. And as she's eating one, I asked her, you know, so do you like the mint flavor in there? And she said, yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> and uh, she swallowed it. And she took another bite. And it pre to my disbelief, she downed it the whole cookie. She was not phased in the least. You know, and when I said, you know, April Fools, she had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know, just like I partook of the Oreo cookie and detested it, many partake of the word of God and spit it out. You know, or even like Kat, they, they, they may read the word, but, but they're totally oblivious to what it's saying. Or they, they might say nice things about it at the start. It may give them a sense of comfort, energy, or even a sweetness. Fresh breath. <laughs> but until it's brought down deep in the secret places of the heart, the faith will never produce the fruit accompanying salvation. The faith will never consummate eternal life. In Mark 4, starting with verse 3, it's the Jesus. He's, he's telling a story. He's telling a parable. And he says, listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. He was scattering the seed. Some fell along the path, and birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on the good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, multiplying 30, 60, or even 100 times. Then Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? 
the farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path, where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble and persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. Eternal life will not be lost. Circumcision of the heart cannot be reversed. But in order for the seal, the guarantee, or the security to be established, the circumcision has to be consummated. You know, what couple out there would go through the whole engagement process, go through and walk down the aisle, and, and go through all the vows, go through the party and the celebration, and then walk away and live separate lives? You know, some of you might be saying, the smart ones. <laughs> but, <laughs> but avoiding the trouble, you avoid the rewards. In avoiding the tensions, you avoid the strong ties of love. In avoiding each other, you avoid marriage. And, and there's never going to be any type of offspring from you. It won't happen. It has to be consummated. Let's, let's turn to Hebrews 6, 4, please. Belief is a covenant of entrusting your life to Christ. The process is His work. You, you don't have to make the rain fall, the seed to grow, but you do let it settle in the deepest parts of your soul. It is secure there, beneath the reaches of Satan's beak. It's not withered by the scorching rays of, of, the, of, the, of the trouble and the trials and the persecutions of your life. It is not choked out by the enticements of this world. It's there, secure. Nothing can move it. You will soon recognize the security of your salvation as the crop of good fruits are exposed. You're sealed. You're rooted and grounded. And the circumcision of the heart cannot be reversed. Now there's one passage that seems to indicate otherwise. And, and before I, I, I put a slam dunk on the security or eternal security, let's take a quick look at Hebrews 6, starting with verse 4. It is impossible. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened to have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of this coming of the coming age, if they fall away, to be brought back to repentance because of their loss, because to their loss. They are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting Him to open to public disgrace. Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed, receives a blessing from God. But the land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and in danger of being, burned, being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are confident of better things in your case, things that accompany salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown Him as you have helped His people and continue to help them. I'm going to stop right there. Uh, we'll go on to, to verse 17 a little bit later, but there are many ways 
to explain away this verse and keep security of et eternal security established. You know, one could say that it, it's it's just a hypothetical statement. You know, if it were possible to fall away, it would be impossible to come back. You know, one could say also that that someone that went through the ceremony or the taste test, you know, they tasted the salvation. They tasted the Holy Spirit. They, they, they were partakers, but they never swallowed it. You know, as soon as the, the trial started, came, it, 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 they went straight to the garbage can with it. This isn't for me. You know, what one could say is, is speaking of another dispensation where salvation can be lost. You know, others say, you know, it is what it is. God's seal and will will never override anyone's. Your faith is secure, but if you reject the security, you will not get a second chance. You know, faith is not like a ring that you can lose. Faith is something deep inside. It is the hope of your life. It is in the depth of your being. It, it, it's from whom you live for. And when that security is deep in your heart, you will not lose it. It's secure. Satan can't touch it. The trials of this life can't overwhelm it. Your hope can't be moved. The NIV interpretation of verse 6 brings about it, it, it in a present state, talking about uh, crucify or putting, crucifying or putting. The King James puts them in kind of the past tense. But uh, these verbs are really in the present active participles. You know, so one can conclude, can conclude that while people are actively shaming the Lord, they could not repent no matter how powerful the understanding of God's word is or how enlightening his promises are. You know, have, have you ever been apologized by someone that, that is apologizing for something that they are currently actively doing? You know, uh, you know I, 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 I'm sorry I'm doing this. You know, many cheapen the grace of God by, by claiming his forgiveness while they are doing the very thing the Lord hates. Sorry, Lord, I, but I just have to gossip about so-and-so. Sorry, Lord, but, but cheating on the taxes, you know, just may get you with just a little extra in the offering plate next Sunday morning. Sorry, Lord, but I just can't forgive that person. Are you getting the picture? You are not and cannot be sorry if you are in the process, not in the process of stopping an offense. You're actively shaming the Lord. You know, in the, the last portion of Hebrews 6 affirms the security of the true believer. You know, and every once in a while you get a kid. Sorry. <laughs> you know? It doesn't happen. When you're sorry, when you repent, you change. In Hebrews 6, 17, the writer of Hebrews affirms the security of the believer. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, it is impossible for God to lie, we who have, have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. You know, when God said 
You know, Jesus, as he's talking to Nicodemus, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He was telling the truth. And because of that truth, because of belief in Jesus Christ, we know we have a secure anchor that will not ever be broken. It says here in Hebrews 6, it's solid. Let's turn to Colossians 2, 6. You know, from these ideas brought about by Scripture, once you have trusted Christ in your inmost secret private place of who you are, once you have trusted Christ in the inner sanctuary of the temple, of your body, behind the curtain where God's presence is, because of your trust, your salvation is secure. You know, in, in Israel, that was where God was, as long as Israel was following after God. God was behind the temple. He was behind the veil. That's where they met God. He was between, on that, between those true cherubs, on the atonement table. And if you've trusted Christ, that's where He is. And He's not going to move. Your salvation is secure. It is sealed in the Holy Spirit, kept as a guaranteed deposit until the day of redemption. In Colossians 2, 6, it says, So then, just as you've received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and on the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him you are also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but the circumcision done by Christ. Again, point one. Having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in the sins and the and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. You know, I, I sometimes like fishing. You know, but there's always the time when, when everybody around me is catching fish and I'm not catching anything. You know, I, I, I watched Body Damn. It was a sad tragedy, but... You know, in Body Dam, there was, there was, the Body Lake, there was fish in there. And, and I hate those fish that don't bite. But there's some fish that, that nibble. They nibble and, and, and they take your bait. And then there's some fish that get hooked by the lip. Others that get hooked by the tail. And you can be careful and you can drive them in. But there's some that swallow the hook. The hook, line, and sinker. May you be a swallower. May the truth of Jesus and the hope of heaven in, with him, to be with him, be the security that you need that will get you through the trials of life. May the enticements of this life be cut off and dead to you. When it's drawing you away from that center of your being, Jesus Christ in your heart. As you, as the peace, joy, and love are exposed in your life, showing forth the fruit that Jesus is in you. May this be done to you by the supernatural work of Christ, of your life entrusted to Christ. Let's pray.